We resume our study of the 16th verse of the 8th chapter of Paul's epistle to the Romans. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Now, we come this evening to what seems to me to be the last aspect of our consideration of this great and all-important subject. There is, as I've been trying to say, nothing which is more urgently important for all Christian people to understand and to grasp than this particular teaching. It is, as I've been trying to show, the highest form of assurance. There is nothing, as Thomas Goodwin puts it, there is nothing beyond this except heaven itself. This is the highest point which any human being can ever reach in this world of time. There is literally nothing beyond it except heaven itself. Here we have God through the Spirit clearly telling us and revealing to us his love for us as individuals. And that is why I say that there's nothing beyond it. God himself letting us know as his children something of his great and eternal love toward us. Well, now we've been looking at this in different ways. We've considered its relationship to sanctification and so on. But now the question that remains is this. Is this then something that we should seek? That question is often put by people. And it seems to me there is only one answer to give, and it's the obvious answer. Certainly, obviously, it must be sought. And the reasons for that, I would have thought, are quite uh, self-evident. If we see that uh, this uh, experience is possible to the Christian believer in this life and in this world, and if anyone feels that he or she doesn't know this, well, surely there is no need for any exhortation. Every Christian should always be seeking the best and the highest. We should never be content with anything less than what is described as possible to the Christian in the New Testament. It seems to me that one of the great uh, troubles in the Christian church today, as it has often been before, is that so many Christian people are content to go on as they are. They want to know that they're saved. They want to know that they're not going to hell. But they seem to be content with it. Whereas surely it should be our desire always to have all that is offered us of the exceeding riches of the grace of God in and through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But this is something, it seems to me, that can be argued also quite obviously by the human analogy. Love surely always demands certainty. It is a characteristic of love. Love not only gives, love also demands. And any person in a state of love is always desiring this certainty. Any any, any hesitation, any doubt, any query in the love relationship tends to spoil everything. Love demands an absolute certainty. And in our relationship to God, God is our Father, we are his children. It is a relationship of love. And I say that it is unnatural, apart from anything else, for the child not to desire an absolute certainty and assurance of the love of his heavenly Father. Now there, I I would have thought, uh, are arguments which would be more than sufficient in and of themselves. But I am aware that an argument is brought forward by people. And I have heard it a great deal uh, comparatively recently. And it sounds, of course, uh, very spiritual and very scriptural. They say, ah, but uh, where is the teaching of the New Testament that asks us to pray for this? Now, you're probably familiar with that argument. Here are the people who say that they must always be scriptural. And that uh, as there is no specific injunction in the New Testament telling us to pray for this blessing of the Holy Spirit, ah, well then... They can't do that because they never do anything unless it is stated explicitly in the scripture. Well, now I want to deal with this argument because I regard this as one of the most dangerous arguments conceivable. 
The same argument is brought by the same people against praying for revival. They say, I don't find anywhere in the New Testament any exhortation to people to pray for revival. So they don't pray for revival. And that is why I say that it's such a dangerous argument to employ. How do we answer it? Then will we answer it like this? We must remember always that the New Testament period and all that we have described, therefore, in the pages of the New Testament was itself a time of revival. There is no question about this. I've already dealt with this point, so I don't stay with it, but it's quite clear that it was taken for granted that the New Testament saints knew and enjoyed this experience. Take the way, for instance, the Apostle Paul puts it in Ephesians 1.13, in whom also he says, having believed, or as this authorized translation puts it, in whom also after that he believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession. Now the apostle takes it for granted about them that they had been sealed with the Spirit of God after that they had believed, or having believed, they were sealed with the Spirit. And that, I say, is indicative of the fact that it, is, that it was the case that at that time it seems quite clearly to have been the case that most, if not all, members of the Christian church had received this great blessing. Now, that's comparable, as I've indicated, to what you get in a time of revival. In a time of revival, you get this great blessing, almost commonplace. It's common to all. The Spirit descends upon a company of people or upon a whole district or country of people, and you'll find that almost everybody in the church is rejoicing in this experience. That's a time of revival. Well, now, very well, then. Let's bear in mind that that was the state of affairs when these New Testament documents were written. So I would argue that I wouldn't even expect this exhortation. What you have in the New Testament is this. You have uh, ex exhortations and injunctions to people who are filled with the Spirit and who are in danger, therefore, of various excesses. As I've often pointed out, I don't know many churches today who would need Paul or anybody else to write the first epistle to the Corinthians to them, especially chapter 12, about the spiritual gifts. But you see, it was necessary then. Why? Well, because these people had been baptized with the Spirit. And the problems of the New Testament so often are the problems of people who are in that state and condition. Obviously, therefore, they do not need a specific injunction to them uh, to pray for this particular witness of the Spirit with their spirits in this matter of assurance. They were rejoicing in it. Indeed, in a sense, that almost constituted one of their dangers. But apart from that, I want to suggest to you that there is a quite a clear and specific teaching in this matter in the New Testament as well as in the Old. Now, I read that portion out of the fifth chapter of the Song of Solomon at the beginning because there I would have thought you've got the typical statement of the experience of a Christian believer desiring the loved one. You remember at first how foolishly uh, this person ignores the overtures of uh, the bridegroom doesn't want to be disturbed and so on. And then, realizing what she was missing, she goes to the door, but he's gone. And she's now frantic. She's searching for him. She goes out at night, a thing that women didn't do. And that's why she was ill-treated by those people in Jerusalem. But uh, her, it shows her desire for the object of her love and how she says to these uh, keepers and so on that if they see him, that they're to tell him that she's sick of love. Well, now, I say that there is a typical statement of it. And if you want to say to me, ah, oh, but that's the Old Testament, well, then your difficulty is not so much that you don't understand this doctrine of the Spirit as that you don't understand the doctrine of the Scriptures. No, no, the relationship in the Old and the New is essentially the same. And what the believer desired in the Old is still what the believer desires in the New. So that when the beloved is not clearly and obviously present, and when the believer is not rejoicing in him instinctively, 
this search for him begins. But coming to the New Testament, we've got an exhortation like this in the second epistle of Peter, first chapter and tenth verse. Wherefore, the rather brethren give diligence to make your calling and election sure. Now that I know pertains mainly to conduct and to behavior, but it isn't exclusive of that. We must with the whole of our being give diligence to make our calling and election sure. And there's no better way of doing that than having this testimony of the Spirit with our spirits that we are the children of God. But I've got something which is still more specific than that. And that is, of course, that statement which we read just now in the 11th chapter of Luke's Gospel. And in particular, that 13th verse, where the Lord uses that well-known picture and illustration. If a son shall ask bread of any of you that is a father, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he for a fish give him a serpent? Or if he shall ask an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him. Now then, there is a plain statement, isn't it? That uh, we are to ask God to give the Holy Spirit to us and the promise that if we do so, he will grant us his spirit. Why is it then that there's any difficulty about this? Well, now then, here we come again uh, to a very common and characteristic uh, difficulty of this present age of believers. The reply that is made is, ah, but that was before Pentecost, that that no longer applies. They said that was in the days before the Holy Spirit had been poured out upon the church. But on the day of Pentecost, the Spirit was poured out upon the church once and forever. Therefore, some would go so far as to say that it is even sinful to pray that prayer and to ask God to give them his Spirit. They say, but you've already got the Spirit. As a Christian, you've got the Spirit. Doesn't your own chapter tell you that? If any man have not the Spirit of God, he is none of his. The Spirit has come, they argue. Well, we mustn't go into this again, because I've already tried to refute it uh, several times. But the reply at that point, of course, is simply this. If you are going to take that dispensational view of this verse, why don't you take a similar view of every verse in the Gospels? Of course, some people do that, I know. They say that the Gospels have got nothing to do with present-day Christians. They applied to the Jews, uh, to whom our Lord was ministering before his death, and uh, they will apply again, we are told, at some future time. But not now. They've got nothing to do with Christians. The Sermon on the Mount, they say, has got nothing to do with Christian people. This verse has got nothing to do with Christian people. Well, then I say, be logical and go on and say, the whole of the Gospels have nothing to do with Christian people at all. You shouldn't read them, you shouldn't expound them, you shouldn't try to put them into practice in your lives. And you see, the moment you say that, how ridiculous the position becomes. No, no, these verses all apply to us today as much as they did to the people to whom our Lord first uttered them. Otherwise, you have to exclude, as I say, the whole of the teaching of the whole of the gospel. This verse, therefore, is true tonight. We are to ask God as our Father for the Holy Spirit. In other words, I'm suggesting that that statement there is an exact parallel with the other famous statement we've already considered in John 7, 37 to 39. Let me read it to you once more. It's such a crucial statement. In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying... If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. Now there, you see, is an exact parallel. Our Lord is talking to these people, and that is his invitation. If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink, and then the promise. And then we've got this explanation. 
that he was speaking here of what was going to be possible after the Spirit had been given in the way that he was given on the day of Pentecost. Now, that does not mean that from the day of Pentecost onwards that all Christians have received the Spirit in all his fullness. I can easily prove that to you. It is not true of all Christians that out of their bellies or inward parts come streams of living water. It's not true. Therefore, the invitation of our Lord in John 7:37 is as applicable tonight as it was in his own day. He is still saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. As he still says to unbelievers, Come unto me, all ye that are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. These things still apply. And I am suggesting to you that Luke 11.13 is an exact parallel with John 7.37-39. In other words, our Lord is there saying, if you are conscious of this lack and of this need, go to God as your Father and offer this petition to him. Now, it's quite true that this is sometimes given to people without their asking. We've seen that in the case of Cornelius. It's happened in the case of many others. But it is also true that some obtain this blessing as the result of their seeking and of their asking. So I'm arguing that the general exhortation is that we should pray for this. And not only that, as you notice, our Lord emphasizes in particular the element of importunity. Ask, seek, and knock. Go on, he says, be persistent. He uses his story, his example, his illustration in order to impress upon us the importance of not only asking, but of asking urgently and of continuing with our asking until we have received the desired blessing. Very well then, I say, if we had nothing else, that one verse in and of itself is more than sufficient. If ye being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? Very well, it is to be sought, therefore. So I ask my second question, how is it to be sought? And here again there is great confusion. Even amongst those who do agree that it should be sought, that it should be asked for. The first uh, negative I have to give is again a warning against the teaching which says, take it by faith. Now that's a common teaching. We already considered that in dealing with verse 16 about the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. But here it is, I've got to mention it once more. There are many who say, well, yes, I agree. This blessing is offered. It's available. Well, then what do you do? Well, you just take God's promise. He says, if you being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? Very well, they say it's quite simple. Ask him, believe that he is your Father, and therefore that he has given it to you. It says, if you ask, he will give. Well, therefore, ask, believe that he has given. It's unbelief, it's doubt not to believe that you've already got the gift. It's a categorical promise. Take it by faith, they say. But you say, I don't feel anything. They say, don't worry about your feelings. Feelings don't matter. You must believe God's word, and therefore you must believe that if you've asked, you must have received. Take it by faith. Thank him for having given it to you, and go on. Now, that's the common teaching. But again, I want to suggest that there is no more dangerous teaching than that. There is nothing, I think, that so accounts for dryness, for deadness, for the lack of a deep experience of the love of God, then that very teaching of take it by faith. Why is it so wrong? Well, for this reason. This is not something that we can take. It is something that is entirely given. You see, it is the Spirit bearing witness with our spirit. You can't take that. It's something that he does. It's the action of the Spirit. You can't take the action of the Spirit. You can only desire it. You can only ask for it. It is the Spirit alone who can do it. You can't take the action of the Spirit upon yourself. It is altogether, I say, something that we have to receive in the sense that we've already defined that term in dealing with verse 16. But people say, but isn't it all by faith? Of course it's all by faith. 
But faith doesn't mean that you persuade yourself you've got something whether you've got it or not. Faith doesn't mean that you take something. Faith means this. Faith means that you believe the word of God. That you believe in the possibility of this experience. That you believe the instruction which tells you to ask and to seek and to knock. And to believe further that if you go on doing that, that you will receive. But that's a very different thing from take it by faith. Now, there is nowhere in the scripture, I suggest to you, anything which suggests this teaching of take it by faith. That is self-persuasion. You cannot take this by faith. What you do is you believe the teaching and then because you're exercising faith, you go to God and you seek it with the whole of your being. That's where your faith comes in. Faith doesn't lay hold on the thing, but faith makes you a supplicant. And then God gives. That is where it seems to me this terrible confusion comes in. It is a misunderstanding of the meaning of faith. Faith is that which produces this urgent desire in us and leads us to pray without ceasing and to do all we can to receive the blessed gift. But if you wanted further proof, it is this. By definition, you must not say that you can receive this gift and feel nothing. Now, we've spent a great deal of time in describing what happens when the Spirit bears witness with our spirits. And what we have seen is this, that it is a tremendous experience that people are moved as they've never been moved before. They're lost in a sense of wonder, love and praise. They're melted into tears. They're humbled. And yet I'm told, don't worry about your feelings, take it by faith. Well, how can you possibly take assurance by faith? The thing's a contradiction in itself. What the apostle is concerned about here, as we've seen, is this. That you and I, as the children of God, should know that we are the children of God. And he's telling us how we can know it. He says, if you're led by the Spirit, and if you've got proof that you are being led by the Spirit, well, then you've got assurance that you're a child of God. But not only that, he says, you've got within you a spirit of adoption, which makes you cry, Abba, Father. You can't cry, Abba, Father, without feeling that you're a child. It's no use saying to a man who's crying, Abba, Father, don't worry about your feelings. The man is full of the most glorious feelings. And the highest of all is this. The Spirit beareth witness with our spirits that we are the children of God. And yet I'm told, don't worry about your feelings. My dear friend, you won't be worrying about your feelings when you get this. You'll be overwhelmed by your feelings. You'll be lost in the most glorious experience that you've ever had. This is essentially experimental, experiential. And to tell people that they can take this of all blessings by faith, not worrying about their feelings, is, I say, to confuse terminology and to deny the teaching of the Scripture about the highest and the greatest experience which ever comes to a human being in this pilgrimage which we call life. No, no, it isn't that. Very well, then, what do we do? Having cleared that point, we now face another difficulty. Because there are people who say, yes, what you've been emphasizing is absolutely right. You will always know when you've got this, and you haven't got it until you know. They're very well, then, they say, this is all you've got to do. All you've got to do is to come to our meetings. Because in our meetings, you can get this. And you can get it. You've simply got to come to the meeting. We've got certain people, if they put their hands upon you, they will give you this gift. They will give you the baptism of the Spirit. And you will know it. You'll be filled, as you say, with these great feelings. All you've got to do, therefore, is to come to our meeting. And you will receive it in that way as the hands are laid upon you. Sometimes they will say that you can get it apart from the laying on of the hands by simply being in the meeting and in the atmosphere of the meeting, and as the results of other people's prayers for you. Now, what of this? Well, again, we've got to test this by the teaching of the Scripture. There are many other tests. It's remarkable to notice that uh, there's no talk about this in the history of the Church throughout the centuries. This is a teaching which has only arisen rarely during this present century. 
and it's been popular only since about 1907. That's an interesting thing in itself, as I'm trying to say on Sunday mornings about the cults. People should ask a question like this. Well, what happened to all the people throughout all those long centuries before these cults and special teachings came in? Did they know nothing about these experiences? And the simple answer is, of course they did. And they knew the true New Testament experience. Well, there's one answer, but there is another. Nowhere in the scripture are we given such teaching, but we are given this teaching. The apostles certainly had this power. They laid hands on people, and the people received the gift of the Holy Ghost. But nobody else had that power apart from the apostles. There was one man, you remember, in Samaria who wanted to have it, Simon the sorcerer. And you remember his story. You'll find it in the 8th chapter of the book of the Acts, verses 18 and 19. No, no, this was clearly something that was confined to the apostles for a specific object and purpose, which isn't difficult to understand. But it is clear that nobody else possessed this power. And it is equally clear that nobody has possessed it ever since. I know that there are certain high sections of the Anglican Church, Anglo-Catholics and so on, who believe that bishops have this power. But if you examine the people who are supposed to have received this gift, you will soon come to the conclusion that the vast majority of the Medinerate, to be very careful, have never received anything of the kind. Their lives prove it and everything else proves it. They know nothing about this testimony of the Spirit and may not even believe in it. So that there is no evidence at all in the Scripture that this gift is something that can be received in that way in a meeting. And that brings me to my third negative, which is again very important. Because there was once a teaching, it isn't so common now, but it was very popular, say, at the beginning of the 19th century, and particularly in America, and it came over to this country, a teaching which talked about tarrying meetings. In other words, there was a great deal to be said for it, only that it went too far, and that is where the devil comes in. The teaching was that this is a very special blessing, and that people should seek it. Now then, they said, we must meet together, and we must seek it and stay in that meeting until we get it. Sometimes they'd even stay for days on end. Now, the danger of that, of course, is obvious. Again, there's nothing to indicate that at all in the New Testament. Furthermore, there is a great deal in the New Testament to show that it is erroneous. Take this, for instance. If you say that you're going to wait and tarry in a meeting until you've got this blessing, well, what you're really saying is that you are the one who determines when it comes, and you are denying the sovereignty and the lordship of the Holy Spirit. He gives this in his own time and in his own way. And for us to lay down conditions that it's got to happen before we leave a meeting he is not only, I say, verging upon blasphemy, but it is also opening the door as widely as it can ever be opened to the strange psychological and psychic and even devilish powers that are ever ready to mislead the children of God and to give them a counterfeit and a false experience. No, those are not the ways whereby we are to seek this blessing. Well, what are the ways? Well, it seems to me it's just this. First and foremost, let us get clear in our minds as to the nature and the character of this experience. You can be a Christian without having this testimony of the Spirit. You cannot be a Christian without having the Holy Spirit in you, but this isn't what I'm talking about. This is the Spirit bearing witness with my spirit. Be clear about the unique character of the thing described. See that this is indeed the fulfillment of John 7, 37, 39. The fulfillment of John 14, where our Lord makes that gracious promise, which was afterwards fulfilled. See that this is the thing taught in all those instances in the book of the Acts of the Apostles. See that uh, this is the thing which the apostle means in the 14th chapter of this epistle in verse 17 when he says, the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Have you got it? Are you rejoicing in it? 
or it's the thing that Peter talks about. Whom having not seen, ye love. In whom, though now ye see him not yet believing, ye rejoice with a joy unspeakable and full of glory. Is that true to your experience? You see, it should be. It can be. Very well, then. If you recognize that it can be, I'm arguing, give yourself no rest until you've got it. Believe that it's possible for a Christian in this life to rejoice in the Lord Jesus Christ with a joy unspeakable and full of glory. Realize it's possible for a Christian to say, the love of Christ constraineth me. Realize that we are meant to know the breadth and the length and the depth and the height and to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge. Do we? It's possible for us to be filled with all the fullness of God. Do we know anything about it? Well, now then, that's the starting point. Get rid of all these foolish objections and all these fears which arise because of the fear of excesses. Realize that you're meant to be a rejoicing Christian who knows the love of God as certainly as you know anything else, and even more certainly. And then, I say, having realized and having believed it, begin to seek for it. But secondly, be careful that you're seeking for the right thing. Don't merely seek an experience. Don't merely go out for manifestations. Seek a knowledge of God. God and of the Lord Jesus Christ and of the love of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't seek balls of fire or any sensation of electricity going through your body. Stop all that. Seek him. Say, I want to know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering. That's what I want. The knowledge of God and of Christ in this intimate manner and the knowledge of his love shed abroad in our hearts. That's the thing to seek. Or if you prefer it, seek to be holy. Seek his glory. Don't merely desire a comfortable feeling, but say to yourself, apart from this, I can never be a true witness. I can no more witness for him than those disciples could before the day of Pentecost. Christ said to them, stay where you are until the power comes. You can't be witnesses to me until the power comes. And say to yourself, is it conceivable then that I can be a witness without it? And isn't that perhaps the reason why I'm such a poor witness? Very well, seek to minister to his glory, to be a witness to his glory. Seek his glory, not your own, nor anything in and of yourself. And then, of course, the third step follows. Do everything you can to please him. As the Apostle has told us in verse 13, mortify the deeds of the body through the Spirit. Do your utmost to be holy. Please him in all things. Do what Peter tells you in the second epistle, first chapter, verses 5 to 7. Beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. Go on giving all diligence. Work hard at it. Keep on. Don't just relax and take it by faith. Add to your faith. Go on furnishing it. That's what the apostle is saying. And it's the teaching of the New Testament everywhere. Do everything that the risen Lord said to the church at Laodicea. You'll find it at the end of the third chapter of the book of Revelation. And then give diligence to seeking him in the word. He's often met his people as they've been reading about him. Read the word, spend time with it, meditate upon it. These are the ways, these are the ways the saints have always followed. And then, on top of it all, importunate prayer. Ask, seek, knock, go on and keep on. Let nothing hinder you. Make your desire known to him with all your might and with all your power. And above everything else, I say, don't give in, don't stop, keep on. Yes, I believe there are steps there. Ask. Ah, oh, if you don't get your reply, seek. And if that doesn't do it, keep on knocking, hammer at the door. As Isaiah puts it, give him no rest nor peace until. That's the teaching of the scripture. Well, now, in order to encourage you to do all this and to 
show how men throughout uh, time in the history of the church have done this very thing and have heeded these exhortations of the scripture. Let me support what I've been trying to say by reading to you the teaching of certain men of God. I'm only going to give you three this evening. Let us start with Thomas Goodwin. Here's Goodwin preaching on Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. It's in the first volume of his complete works. You that believe are to wait for this promise. See, this isn't the teaching that began, you know, about 1907. Thomas Goodwin was saying all this 300 years ago. You that believe are to wait for this promise. As the Jews waited for the coming of Christ, so are you to wait for the coming of the Holy Ghost into your hearts. It is said that the Father served God day and night, waiting for the promise, namely, Christ to come. Serve you a God day and night faithfully, walk humbly. There is a promise of the Holy Ghost to come and fill your hearts with joy unspeakable and glorious, to seal you up to the day of redemption. Sue this promise out, wait for it, rest not in believing only, Rest not in assurance by graces only. There is a further assurance to be had. It was the last legacy Christ left upon earth. Look John 14, 16. He said there that he would send the promise of the Father, this very promise of sending the Comforter. Read Luke 24, 49. Therefore, sue out the will of Christ. You see, it's like going to court. You sue a man. Well, you sue Christ for this. Sue out that last legacy of his. It was the fruit of his ascension. When he was ascended up and received this promise, then he poured it out. And again he goes on. The Ephesians had it, you see. They were sealed. For afterward, chapter 430, he exhorts them not to grieve the Holy Spirit by which they were sealed. The Thessalonians had it. 1 Thessalonians 1.10. They received the word with such joy that he saith they waited for the coming of Jesus Christ from heaven. For that is the next step. Heaven is next unto it. And to wait for Christ when you are thus sealed. Those that Peter wrote to had it. 1 Peter 1 8. In whom believing ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Listen to this. Thus Ordinary it was in the primitive times. It was ordinary, he says, thus in the primitive times. Where the defect lies, God knows. But certainly it might be more common if men would sew it out. Such a promise there is. He is therefore called the spirit of promise because he is promised as a sealer. Only, my brethren, Let me give you a direction or two. First, believe this promise. Wait for it by faith. You see the difference? He doesn't say take it by faith. He says wait for it by faith. Make it the aim of your faith. We are said to receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Galatians 3.14 Believe there is such a thing. Aim at it. Wait for it. And serve God day and night in all humility to obtain it. Rest in no other lower and under assurance. And in the end, the Lord will give it. The reason why men attain it not is because they rest in other assurance. And they do not aim at this. They content themselves with bare believing. And that their consciences are quieted. But my brethren, there is such a work as sealing by the Spirit. If you have faith. There is a spirit and a spirit of promise made to believers which ye may receive by faith. This is the first reason why he is called a spirit of promise because he is promised to believers as he is a sealer. Well now, that's perfectly plain, isn't it? Thomas Goodwin. Let me come and just read you a brief extract now from George Whitfield. The next century, you remember. Here is uh, Whitfield uh, writing... In 1739, on Thursday, December the 20th, this is how he puts it. It is a dreadful mistake to deny the doctrine of assurances, or to think it is confined to a time of persecution, or to the primitive ages of the church. 
not only righteousness and peace, but joy in the Holy Ghost, which is the consequence of assurance, is a necessary part of the kingdom of God within us. And though all are not to be condemned who have not an immediate assurance, yet all ought to labor after it. I really believe one great reason why so many go mourning all their life long is owing to ignorance of their Christian privileges. They have not assurance because they ask not. They ask it not because they are taught that it does not belong to Christians of these last days. And he might very well have been writing today, mightn't he? Whereas I know numbers whose salvation is written upon their hearts as it were with a sunbeam. They can rejoice in God their Savior and give men and devils the challenge to separate them, if they can, from the love of God in Christ Jesus their Lord. Dear Redeemer, enlighten all thy followers to see their privileges, and never let them cease wrestling with thee, till thou dost bless them by assuring them of their eternal salvation. And then there's this bit of poetry. Why should the children of a king go mourning all their days? Great Comforter, descend and bring the tokens of thy grace. Assure each conscience of its part in the Redeemer's blood, and bear thy witness with each heart that it is born of God. Now, that's only one of many quotations that I could give you out of the journals of George Whitfield. I hope you've got this book. It's on sale. Read through it yourself and mark out these most wonderful passages that you will find there. But let me end with a 19th century man, and again it's Charles Haddon Spurgeon. Now this is how Spurgeon puts it. In a sermon which he preached on February the 24th, 19, 1861, just over a hundred years ago, you see, on the Solomon Song, chapter 8, verses 6 and 7. She longeth that she may know the love of his heart and that she may experience the power of his arm. Can we not each of us join the spouse in this prayer tonight? O oh Lord, let me know that my name is engraven on thy heart. Not only let it be there, but let me know it. Write my name not only in thy heart, but may it be as a signet on thy heart that I may see it. Doubtless, there are the names of very, very many written upon Christ's heart who have not yet been able to see their names there. They are there, but are not written as on a signet. Christ has loved them from all eternity. His heart has been set on them from everlasting. But as yet, they have never seen the signet. They have never had the seal of the Spirit to witness within that they are born of God. While their names may be in his heart, they have not seen them there as a seal upon his heart. And no doubt there are multitudes for whom Christ has fought and conquered, and whom he daily keeps and preserves, who have never seen their names written as a seal upon his arm. Their prayer is that they may see Christ's love visibly, that they may discover it in their experience, that it may be beyond a question, and no more a matter of doubt, that his hand and his heart are engaged for their eternal salvation. I repeat it. Ye can all join in this prayer, ye people of God. It is a cry that you would put up now and continue to put up till it is fully answered. Oh, let me know, my Lord, that I am thine, bound to thine heart, and let me know that I am thine, protected and preserved by thine arm. This is the prayer. I shall not say more upon it, because I wish to speak more at length upon the arguments with which it is here pleaded. And then he goes on to show the pleadings that were used by the spouse in the Song of Solomon. But let me just read you another quotation from Spurgeon, where we've got this same thing once more. He says, These operations of the Spirit of God are easily to be obtained by the Lord's children. And then he says, there is another thing to be done as well, and that is to pray. And here I want to remind you of those blessed words of the Master. And then he quotes the words that I've already quoted to you from the 11th chapter of Luke's Gospel. 
You see, there is a distinct promise to the children of God that their Heavenly Father will give them the Holy Spirit if they ask for his power. And that promise is made to be exceedingly strong by the instances joined to it. If there be a promise that God can break, which there is not, this is not the promise, for God has put it in the most forcible and binding way. I know not how to show you its wonderful force. Did you ever hear of a man who, when his child asked for bread, gave him a stone? Go to the worst part of London, and you will, and you, and will you find a man of that kind? You shall, if you like, get among pirates and murderers, and when a little child cries, Father, give me a bit of bread and meat, does the most wicked father fill his own little one's mouth with stones? Yet the Lord seems to say that this is what he would be doing if he were to deny us the Holy Spirit when we ask him for his necessary working. He would be like one that gave his children stones instead of bread. Do you think the Lord will ever bring himself down to that? But he says, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? He makes it a stronger case than that of an ordinary parent. The Lord must give us the Spirit when we ask him, for he has herein bound himself by no ordinary pledge. He has used a simile which would bring dishonor on his own name and that of the very grossest kind if he did not give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him. Oh, then, let us ask him at once with all our hearts. Am I not so happy as to have in this audience some who will immediately ask? I pray that some who have never received the Spirit, Holy Spirit at all may now be led while I am speaking to pray, Blessed Spirit, visit me, lead me to Jesus. But especially those of you that are the children of God, to you is this promise especially made. Ask God to make you all that the Spirit of God can make you. Not only a satisfied believer who has drunk for himself, but a useful believer who overflows the neighborhood with blessing. And I can give you my last quotation very briefly because it is a short one. It's in this volume of Revival Sermons by Charles Haddon Spurgeon, which has been printed recently and which is available. It's on Romans 8.30, Predestination and Calling. Listen to this. He's talking about assurance. And he's been saying that uh, the believer may know it as surely as if he read it with his own eyes. Nay, he may know it more surely than that. And this is what he says. What would some of you give if you could arrive at this assurance? Mark, if you anxiously desire to know, you may know. If your heart pants to read its title clear, it shall do so ere long. He doesn't say take it by faith now, ere long. No man ever desired Christ in his heart with a living and longing desire, who did not find him sooner or later. If thou hast a desire, God has given it thee. If thou pantest and criest and groanest after Christ, even this is his gift, bless him for it. Thank him for little grace and ask him for great grace. He has given thee hope, ask for faith. And when he gives thee faith, ask for assurance. And when thou gettest assurance, ask for full assurance. And when thou hast obtained full assurance, ask for enjoyment. And when thou hast enjoyment, ask for glory itself. And he shall surely give it thee in his own appointed season. Well, there it is for you. 17th century, 18th century, 19th century. And again, I could give you almost endless quotations along the same line from men who are Calvinists, Arminians, anything you like. They all teach the same thing. You don't take it by faith. You ask for it. You plead. You seek. You knock. You groan. You wrestle. These are their terms. And you go on doing so until you have received it. Here it is for you. By a man from Wales who put it in a hymn. Here's the English translation. William Williams. Speak, I pray thee, gentle Jesus. Oh, how passing sweet thy words. 
Breathing all my troubled spirit peace, which never earth affords. All the world's distracting vices, all the enticing tones of ill, at thine accents mild, melodious, or subdued, and all is still. Tell me, tell me thou art mine, O Saviour. Grant me an assurance clear. Banish all my dark misgivings. Still my doubting, calm my fear. All my soul within me yearneth now to hear thy voice divine. So shall grief be gone forever and despair no more be mine. Beloved people, do you know this? Have you seen, if I may borrow the language, have you seen your name on the signet ring? Has the Spirit borne witness with your spirit that you are a child of God? Have you heard these accents, mild, melodious? Have you had this supreme assurance? Or are you resting merely by saying, Ah, well, I believe the Scriptures. It says if a man believes, he's saved. I don't want any more. Are you resting on deductions which you draw about the characters and the marks of the Christian men? You say, that's enough for me. I know I'm saved. How can you speak in that way? When he himself is offering to tell you the promise is here. The spirit of promise. And the promise is this assurance. This absolute certainty that we are the children of God and that the inheritance is prepared for us. The spirit is a witness. He is a seal and an earnest. And this is possible. We have no right to remain uncertain. Because as long as we are uncertain, we shall be to that extent poor witnesses. The best witnesses to the Lord Jesus Christ the world has ever known have always been men who've had full assurance and the enjoyment and the feelings and the certainty and the ravishing of their hearts. This knowledge, this seeing something of the glory to which Spurgeon exhorts us. Christian people, do you know in this way? Have you got this highest, supremest assurance? Well, I say, seek it. Seek it in the way indicated. With your life, with your obedience, with everything, with your words. He likes to hear you asking, as any parent worthy of the name likes to hear a little child asking. Tell me thou art mine, O Savior. Grant me an assurance care and go on until you've got the assurance care and you will rejoice with a joy unspeakable and full of glory. O Lord our God, we pray thee by thy Spirit to open our understandings to this blessed truth. O God, deliver us from prejudices. Deliver us from fears. But grant, O Lord, that we may see this glorious possibility if we have not already received it. And grant, O Lord, that we may be so disturbed by thy Spirit that we shall indeed seek with all our being and all our power that we may receive and rejoice and may then live ever always only to the praise of the glory of thy grace. Lord, hear us in this our prayer. And now may the grace of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship and the communion of the Holy Spirit abide and continue with us now this night throughout the remainder of this hour short, uncertain, earthly life and pilgrimage and until we shall see not as in a glass darkly but face to face, and assurance, the highest assurance, be turned to complete knowledge. Amen. We do hope that you've been helped by the preaching of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. 
All of the sermons contained within the MLJ Trust audio library are now available for free download. You may share the sermons or broadcast them. However, because of international copyright, please be advised that we are asking first that these sermons never be offered for sale by a third party. And second, that these sermons will not be edited in any way for length or to use as audio clips. You can find our contact information on our website at mljtrust.org. That's mljtrust.org.